Hi, and welcome to Shaking Sports Journeys. Coming to you um, all the way today from uh, Costa del Glasgow. As you can see, rocking some aviators. Um, some of us um, are in warmer climates, i.e. the big man is in LA. Um, big Nick is in Jersey as well, so he's taking in some sunshine. But don't knock Glasgow. We get sunshine as well from time to time. <laughs> so today, folks, um, interesting, interesting episode for you. Um, I'm bringing two ex-teammates together. One is joining us to be a co-host, as I mentioned, all the way from LA. So I say hello to Adam Ash. How are you, mate? Very well, and I'm glad to be back on the podcast as a co-host. It's been a while. The time difference has been getting in between us, but here we are. Let's go. Let's go, mate. Let's go. And I brought two fellow ex-Glasgow Warriors teammates together, um, but uh, Big Nick has decided to to hang the rugby books up and get on the boxing gloves and has taken up heavyweight boxing. I say hello to Nick Campbell. How are you, mate? Shaky, I'm good. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on here with you and the fellow Scott, Glasgow Warrior, Adam Ash. So, huh? Indeed, good. indeed. Funny story, actually, just before we go any further. And I only, only just found this out recently myself. So I was chatting to my neighbour. He lives about four or five doors down from me. He says to me, oh, mate, I've been watching the podcast. Really, really good. You're getting some really good rugby content on. Me and all my mates, are, we love our rugby. Actually... You had that guy, Adam Ash, on. My mate was telling me, mate, his name, his nickname's Big Sexy. And I was like, aye. Is that what he's, and he's like, oh, aye, everybody calls him Big Sexy. So since then, I've been chucking it out in the in the chat a little bit. Is this true, Nick? As I've known Adam Ash as Big Sexy for about 10 years, maybe 11 years. <laughs> there you go, mate. I could think of worse. Good think of worse D- nicknames. DJ what? Big Sexy likes to call himself when he's on the decks. Well, that is, um, I will admit that my nickname is Big Sexy. Uh, it was actually, so when Nick and I were at Glasgow Warriors, there was a lad called Murray McConnell, um, who's a great lad. He's uh, one of the greats in rugby. And he, uh, we were out one night and I ended up in my wife's front at the end of the night for some reason, <laughs> in apartment in Glasgow. And for some reason, the day was stuck. And uh, when I started DJing a little bit, um, I remember after a Scotland game, played against Ireland and the Six Nations, and then after the game, went to DJ in a nightclub in Edinburgh, and they had this big projector on the wall outside the club, and I turned up to, to the club, and I seen DJ Big Sexy across the wall. <laughs> the moment it hit home for me. So, look, I'm over here now, and I'm, I'm starting to make a bit of a name for myself out here, so I've got a few lined up. Uh, so, you know, you just got to run with these types of things. Listen, as you do, mate, as you do. I didn't realise you were as good as that. I heard some of your, your live stuff on Insta and I thought, pretty good on the decks, but you obviously, you play a bit as well in the clubs. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's when your career, when your rugby career ends, we might see you on the strip to Vegas, Ibiza. Who knows? I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to cut in here, but I don't know if you remember the mix, the mix tapes, the CDs you used to make for me and Finn Russell driving through the training with air on a Thursday night. And it was right, it must have been right back at the beginning when Ashley was just learning learning the ropes and, you know, how to mix things and cut things in because it was a bit ropey. But <laughs> there was some was old that- school, old school bangers on there that was like proper old school, that like 90s dance music you would have heard in Glasgow and me and Finn Russell used to drive through. Finn loved it. But I well, always remember. And fa- I'd love to find one of those CDs if I've still got one somewhere. I'll, I'll send you one over. That, the 90s dance Bangers were actually a request from Finn. And I think as well, MC Bryce was involved in those as well. So Bryce would yeah. come in every minute and he'd be like, oi, oi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he likes a bit of it. Funnily enough, we're both over here in LA at the moment. He's playing at the Guiltinis too. So potentially a double act. Uh, maybe, you know, the US, the land of the opportunity. So we could potentially see. Bryce is still known. I, I remember uh, Dave Bishop, who actually played with Bryce at Jersey. One of the first things he said to me was, he's some MC Bryce who used to get him up the front of the bus. And all the Jersey old boys would be up. But you're talking about guys that are in like the early 70s, late 70s, proper old school rugby lads. And Bryce would get up on the mic on the bus and give it a bit. And like they'd just be sitting like that. I'm like, what's this lad up to? Do you know what I mean? I, I used to kill myself laughing thinking about it. Brilliant. Well, uh, he's been doing it here as well, Nick. He's, he got up the front of the bus and started MC. We, we went out for a team night out, went to his restaurant, 
a few drinks and stuff. We got them the bus back to the headquarters and the head coach was on the bus and Bracey grabs a make up at the front and starts spitting to all the team and the head coach was like, ah, <laughs> know, what's going on? <laughs> like, he doesn't stop this lad. He's, uh, he, sounds like a lad. he sounds like somebody you need to line up for a future episode, mate. No, you can you can't get Bryce a red face for blowtorch, honestly. <laughs> he's, uh, he's somebody that we should get on because he's got some exciting stuff coming up in the next few well. <laughs> he's just back from injury. He's also just launched a, a sock brand, a sock company. Um, it's actually performance gear, but he's starting with like, you know the socks that you can wear that stop your, your feet sliding about in your boots when you're playing football, <laughs> rugby or whatever. So he's just launched these and, and the, the name of the brand's actually Oi Oi. Oi Oi Socks, Oi Oi Performance comes from, his, comes, from his, comes from his MC in career. That's it, it all ties in, so it's exciting for him, but we'll get him on soon for sure. He's a good lad, he, he's, he likes a good laugh. Right then, Nicholas, let's uh, let's get talking about this. Um, firstly, your rugby career, um, and then the transition into the new sport, which is a really interesting story. But my first question to you is, how long did you? How long was your rugby career? Um, how did you enjoy it, etc.? I started playing rugby when I was nine years old, so you know I can I grew up playing the sport, went through all the age group stuff, you know, pathway things, similar to what Adam would have went through when he was a young nipper, and then ended up going, getting my first kind of academy professional contract back in two thousand and nine with Glasgow Warriors, and um, was there for four years. Left in two thousand and thirteen. Joined Jersey, played four years there. But, um, you know, I, I went through all the age group stuff. Uh, played Scotland under 18, Scotland under 20. Represented Glasgow quite a few times. Went on to play nearly 100 games in the English Championship for Jersey after I left Glasgow. So, I mean, listen, I've not, not quite reached the, the heights in the rugby world that my, your co-host did by being capped for Scotland or anything like that. But I'm very proud of what I managed to achieve and stuff in the sport. And, I loved every minute of it, made some friends for life, like big man and I, uh, loved every moment of it, but I always had a kind of passion for boxing, even when I was young, I was always, you know, going along to amateur boxing clubs and doing an extra bit of training outside of rugby, and um, I decided back in 2017 that it was time to hang up the boots and uh, pick up the boxing gloves and, you know, scratch an itch and see how far I could go and what I could achieve. Had you let hands go before? Obviously, you said you were into boxing, but had you done much to think that you could make that transition? Uh, I'd never had a fight. I, you know, I'd done a bit of sparring and things like that. Uh, coming up to the end of my last contract at Jersey, I'd kind of I was toying with the idea of what to do next, and I had done a little bit um, without the club's knowledge because you're not really supposed to go away and spar a boxer or anything like that. So. We won't I, tell, I, mate. We won't tell. Nah, I'm not worried anyway. They can they can do one. But um I, nah, so I, I no, do you know what? Like I kinda looked at, you know, what was going on and I looked at other guys and thought if if they can do it, I can do it. And uh I just backed myself really. You know, I'm a good athlete. I've always been fit, I've always been strong, always trained hard, and I thought if I, I can apply some of that to boxing, then who knows what where it could take us. What were you used to like at Glasgow Warriors then? Obviously, Nick was there for four years. Um, Ashy, were you there the four, whole four years he would have been there or was it on and off? I think Nick was maybe there the year before I came in, but I pretty much left high school and then went straight into the, the Glasgow Warriors Academy system. And when I got there, Big Nick was there. I think he'd been right, in, I think yeah. the academy system was slightly different before I came in because that year I came in, it changed. Um, but yeah, Nick had been the, the time that I, I was kind of in and out because I played a bit of sevens and was away to New Zealand for a bit of time as well. But yeah, big Nick and I shared a changing room for the best part of a couple of years three, and three the years, likes of Johnny Ray, Ben Russell, um, you know, and a whole load of other guys were in there too. So um, we had... Really Hugh, don't forget Rosa Hughes. Rosa Hughes, Glasgow's hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know. oh, I actually can remember winding Rory up in the changing room and he just like he bit on everything I, I like Rory he's a great lad but cannot take getting wound up at all just uh, I full throttle like want to fight you like he was, he was a good lad to have in there you could always get him revved right up if you needed a bit of entertainment Was he huge back then as well Ashley? Big Rosa Nick I'm talking was he was he, oh, was he, was he, was he, was he always big? 
Nick was massive. He was actually bigger than he than he is now. He trimmed down a fair bit for boxing, but he was always enormous. Obviously, being a lock, you need the height in rugby. Uh, but uh, he's one of the guys where you walk in as a, a fresh faced youngster at high school and you'd be like, ah, holy shit, he's enormous. <laughs> Uh, but we, me and Ash, do you know what me and Ash actually, we got on straight away. Um, it's it's kind of weird sometimes, you gun, because you, you know, you're chucking 30, 40 lads together and not everybody gets on. There's different dynamics and, you know, different, me and Ash, you always just, you know, we we always had a laugh. We always had a kind of mutual respect for one another and we always, we always had a good bit of crack. So I actually think we, we might have sat right next to one another for a long time in the changing room as well. So. Especially those guys that you sit next to in the changing room. I know it sounds a bit old and cliched, but I those were the kind of guys that you would pick up a bit of friendship with and a bit of a closer bond with, and you could relate to it a bit more. I can imagine he was the worst behaved of the two years, Nick. I don't know. I get the impression you're the ultimate professional. Am I wrong? I, no, Ashley was actually quite well behaved. To be fair, it was a. Uh, I was. I was probably one of the worst ones that get all right, okay. Yeah, like, you know, pulled up all the time and stuff like that. I'm a, I don't know, I'm a bit stubborn, kind of set in my ways to, to a lot of things. And you know, there'll be certain older lot like more of the more experienced pros might not have thought that I gave them the respect I should have gave them. And you've been involved in a few scraps at training and stuff like that, but I loved all that, so it was sound. <laughs> Love it, mate. I love it. It was setting you up for the future anyway, mate. You need a bit, you need a bit of grit in the uh, team. Uh, so, it's all, uh, so it's all good. So you you made uh, the you made the transition, mate, from uh, from one painful sport into one a little bit more painful where you where you really are getting battered now. And um, those scraps and training would have stood you in good stead. But how did you how did you feel how was it when you made that full decision that that's it, I'm going into boxing. Had you got a gym sorted? Did you have a coat sorted? Aye, so basically, um, I was, I'm was. i still living in Jersey, um, but I decided that I was going to go through... The, Jersey's got an amateur boxing club, but they're affiliated to England. And I decided I was going to join a club up in Scotland and go through the Scottish system for the amateur boxing. Like that? This, aye. What, well, I'm obviously I'm Scottish, so that was... First off, second thing was I felt as if I had more chance of winning the Scottish Championships, getting picked for the Scotland team and getting to get the international experience and get fast-tracked a little bit. So it was a bit of a, you know, well, not a gamble, but that was just the route I decided to go down. Uh, I managed to win, uh, I'll go back a wee bit, I joined Dennis in ABC uh, with Jamie Cunningham. Um, he said it was, you know, he liked, I went up and trained a couple of times and he says, look, I think you can do something. Let's see what it takes us. And then managed to win the Scottish Novice Championship my first two fights. Uh, that's why a guy was seven fights and less. And I just thought that was a kind of good good way to get started. You'll be fighting guys on a similar level to you and see what it takes you. And then um, managed to win the Western District title in my third fight. Um, but that was open class, so you could fight anybody. It doesn't matter how many fights they'd had. And ended up fighting a boy who'd come up from heavyweight to super heavyweight, Conor McDonald, and he's a really experienced boxer, boxed all over the world with Scotland and stuff. I managed to beat him in my third fight, won the Western District in a 3-2 split. It was a really close fight. He's a great boxer, but I was just too big for him. He's not a proper super heavyweight, and uh, it was a good good learning fight. And then off the back of that, got invited to come into some of the Scotland stuff. Uh, managed to win the Scottish Elite titles after that. Uh, fought a couple of times for Scotland and internationals and stuff like that. Represented them, you know, best of British, great, great British championships, and just you know, immersed myself in it and tried to get as much amateur experience as I could before I thought about turning professional. Uh, that was always my, that was always my vision. I didn't really see myself just going from professional rugby straight into professional boxing because you get hurt. So I wanted to try and learn as much as I possibly could develop myself as much as I possibly could and I yeah, just see what it took me. My goal wasn't actually ever to fight professionally when I first done this. It was to go to the Commonwealth Games. But right. when COVID kicked in and um, kind of put a kibosh to anything happening in the amateur boxing scene. And obviously I'm not a young lad anymore. I'm you know I'm not old but I'm not young. So I thought maybe this is the time to turn pro and see what happens. So that was probably the biggest determining factor in me deciding to step away from the amateur box and 
have a crack at the pros, but you know, everything happens for a reason, and I'm a big believer in fate, so I feel as if this is what I was always supposed to do, and this was always the way it was supposed to happen, so. I'll tell you a funny story, right? So, I was at the, the Youth Commonwealth Games in 2013 or something like that, and uh, it was on the, we went to the Isle of Man, and I was there for seven rugby representing Scotland, um, and it was a great wee tournament. Like obviously, the Isle of Man's a tiny place. Teams coming in from Australia, all over the place. But the boxing team were there as well. Um, the Scottish boxing team, and it was the mailman. He was there. The young Charlie. Charlie Flynn. Flynn. Uh, he, uh, he I've was, met Charlie a couple of times. He was uh, he was fighting, and that's where he kind of sort of made, though well, started to make that name for himself. And I was sitting eating lunch one day, and um, two of the coaches came over and said, "Big man." How heavy are you? What height are you? And I told them I was like I'm six foot four and 110 kilos. And like, ah, we want you to come and box. You'll be a heavyweight for us. And I, at the moment, I was like, I was, I was like, at the time I was like, oh, holy shit, well, maybe maybe there's a, a career for me there. But obviously, Nick, you've went and done that, so it's cool. Like just like funny how things like that, like you know, pop up and um, obviously to see like unbelievable boxers like start off there at the Youth Commonwealth Games and progress through. And I don't know what Charlie's doing now. Is he actually is he still fighting? No, nah, I think, you know what, Charlie actually got really unlucky. For, he, he got a really bad head injury, or not head injury, but cut. And it happened to him like three times in a row. And I think he just kind of got disillusioned with the sport. Mm-hmm. So he stepped away from it. Now, there was talk of him maybe coming in and doing a coaching role with the Scottish boxing team uh, at Bridgeton. I don't know if anything developed from that, but I, he, what he achieved in amateur boxing and what he had managed to achieve in professional boxing still, you know what I mean? Everybody knows who the mailman is in Scotland oh, after the, the interviews and the uh, he was making uh, he was making he was making waves. He was on the Scotland the, the evening the, the news channel that night. He was sitting in the he was everyone was loving him because he's just your normal Glasgow boy. No problem. you're just normal lad and people I think really really warm to that. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was how does rugby training differ from boxing training? The way I would put it, and I don't know, Ash, you'll maybe back me up on this because he's still playing, but when you're playing in season in rugby, it's not about going all out, putting everything in every training, well, you put everything in every training session, but every training session isn't like balls to the wall, like max efforts. It's about getting yourself ready to play on a Saturday because that's when it matters. In boxing, you maybe only fight once a month once every two months, once every three months. Mm-hmm. So every training session, it's almost or every training camp is almost like a pre-season. So you're get, gearing yourself up for eight weeks, which is like a kind of, you know, maybe two blocks of a pre-season in rugby. So the intensity in training, I find, is a lot higher than what it was when I used to play. But I always get asked the question, what's the harder sport? And I say, well, it depends what you're asking you're asking physically what's the harder sport, without a doubt, it's probably rugby because the injuries, the physicality, you know, you've got 19 stones and, and Kiwis running on you, you know, you're breaking legs, knees, shoulders, neck injuries. It's just all over. Bro- boxing, obviously enough, is a brutal sport and it's physical, but it's just not as brutal on the body, believe it or not. But, in, you know, in my opinion, in terms of the mental side of things I box in a one-on-one sport it's not a team sport you've got anybody to fall back on I'm not saying it's like completely different but it does have the edge and the mentality and like you see you still need to turn up and train you've not got guys to pick you up if you're having a bad day so there's a lot of different variables to it but it's hard to you know nail one down and say that's a harder sport that's the harder sport it depends what you're asking see, yeah, I, I, sorry mate on you go sorry, I'll say I uh, we we went to do a boxing session uh, at one of the gyms in Glasgow. It's actually um, it's a gym that you've been to a fair bit. It's in the south side. Uh, I went I, I went the year before. I I went. I've been it with that the mad guy. I, I remember fighting um, one of the other boys in the team, and we weren't we weren't actually meant to be fighting each other. It was kind of like look, you can go in and you can do body shots only. I don't want you punching in the head because if you get knocked out, that's going to keep you out of rugby. But I went in. And uh, I thought, uh, first of all, I thought Jamie Batty, who's a good friend of mine, and he's a lot shorter than me. And what I thought the experience was going to be like was actually a lot different to how it turned out. You don't think about, 
as an onlooker, you don't think about the fact that you have to avoid getting punched too, and that and how that plays out when you're actually in the right. ring. It's different to what you think. And then the old lad, what's the old lad that owns that gym's name, Nick? I should know. He's, he's a legendary boxer. Uh, is it Gary? Ian? Oh, Gary, uh, Gary Jacobs. That's him. So, Gary Jacobs, uh, he would uh, do a, a minute round. So, I, I done a two minute round with Gary Jacobs. Um, and when I first went in, I tried to take his head off with a haymaker. <laughs> uh, but then he looked me and he said, I'm going to have to hurt you now, big man. So we ended up, um, I ended up getting battered around the ribs for the rest of the, the rounds and it was sore. But I've never felt pain like that in my shoulders and arms before. It's like the lactate buildup. I don't know if that's what you call it, but it's just like, it's just like a numbness. You, you can't even move your arms. You can't do anything. And I found that like completely different to anything I'd experienced in the rugby field before. You know, well, like, like you, you know, you, you touched on it earlier. Like I've obviously my body type's changed a lot since I used to play rugby, but I was 122, 123 kilos when I played rugby. I'm now 115, so that's like just over a stone. But mm. it's you know, if you're a massive upper body, massive arms, massive shoulders, you've got to hold them up there, you've got to protect yourself, you've got to keep your hands high, you've got to move. It's harder to throw punches. You've got big, heavy arms from lifting weights and stuff. So it's funny in a way because you would look at, like, I always remember seeing, do you know who Gennady Golovkin is? I'm sure CK will know who he is. Right. Triple G. Well, yes. There's a picture of him and he's wearing, like, a pair of cream chinos and a white polo shirt. And then there's a picture of this, like, bodybuilder who's on I don't know he's on he's on every steroid under the plant like under the, do you know what I mean son and he's massive and it says it's crazy that 99% of people don't realise the guy on the left would kill the guy on the right I mean nothing, nothing in boxing do you know what I mean they actually it can work against you if you're too muscle bound so that I that's the one thing as a rugby player like I found quite hard was losing my bulk my size but you know I can punch 10 times harder than a could then it's it's just mad faster never... as well faster as well Ex exactly Ex exactly so that's that's probably one of the biggest things that I've had to change from my rugby days was trimming down a bit losing a bit of mass but gaining a lot of power you've done you've I didn't actually realise mate that you, you've you've actually done quite a bit in the amateurs I, 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 if I'm being honest obviously I've only really come properly across you in recent times since the pro games kicked in Um and I, I didn't realise that you've you've got quite a decent pedigree there. You want some, you've had some good experience around the circuit in Scotland. You know, you could have went to the Commonwealth. That's how. So you got, you were, you were, you were, you were very ready. Obviously, they say the amateur game is very different to the pro game. I hear that. I hear that a lot from boxers. But you, you went straight into. You didn't have no ordinary debut um, in pro boxing because you were on matchroom boxing's card. You know, a big, big card that night. Um, what was the pressure like of going, like, you're about to go out with your rugby team, take the pitch? What was the difference of being that one guy, lights on you, you could get sparked out if you make a mistake in there and you need to be on your game? Uh, you know, I feel as if my background in rugby kind of prepared me for a lot of the pressures that you experience. Like you say, it's different because it's an individual sport, so you're going in there on your own. Like you say, one punch at heavyweight box change it and you could be winning the fight for 12 rounds and all it takes is one punch and the guy drops you and that's it makes it game over but um, nah like, I took it in my stride I think being in the bubble that week all the kind of press you know training and stuff and how to deal with the media and everything we have when we went through academy structures and stuff when we were younger prepared me for how to deal with all that like I say I'm a bit, I'm a bit older as well you know what I mean I'm a bit wiser in some aspects um, so I, I kind of took it all in my stride I used the pressure to try and make sure that I put on a good performance because I knew everybody out there, 90% of the people out there were going, this guy's, you know, this is a gimmick this guy's got no chance What's like, this is all just, you know, a PR stunt, blah 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 so I just used that and I try and use all these people that, you know, chat shit on social media platforms and stuff to my advantage because that's the, the, the world we live in nowadays, so no just took it all in my stride, felt privileged, you know, very grateful that I got an opportunity to make my debut on such a big stage. Guys fight all their lives and never get that chance. So, 
I I was just very grateful, wanted to put on a performance and try to use all, all the nerves and anticipation and stuff and, and putting that in, you know, putting that into the ring and what I'd done on the night. So no, it was it was an amazing experience. I wouldn't have changed it for the world. The only thing would have changed the freaking type of crowds there. So yeah. That would have been the only thing. Scottish blocks on that you you you've 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 put you've racked up two wins already. Went out to Serbia. That's about a different experience yeah. going out there. <laughs> Alright, were you? Did they not try and put it in dodgy in your breakfast or anything? No, do you know what? Serbia was a, was a great place. Um, I could tell you some funny stories about that. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> I'll tell you one because it's the funniest. But the, the venue changed three times. So we were supposed to be in one venue. It was in a hotel. I get cancelled. We then moved to this outdoor venue. That get cancelled. The guy who was then promoting the show, because this wasn't my match room. This was with, um, I can't even remember the name, my man, MSN Boxing Management. Mad Martin, the pole, he's the guy who's the promoter. That's what everybody calls him, Mad Martin. Really lovely guy, but absolutely mental. And uh, he he was organising it, so he, he finally got us in this basketball arena. And it was, I it was a decent it arena. Like, I thought it looked like a I, it, was, it was decent, it was all right, it was good enough, but obviously there, was, there wasn't many people there and all that. So we had all that. Then my opponent changed twice. So I was supposed to be fighting this awkward southpaw. That guy pulled out last minute and I had this replacement. And to be honest with you, like when I seen the guy, I was like, Jesus Christ, you know what I mean? I'm going to kill this guy. So anyway, you can only fight with putting in front of you and fair play to him for stepping through the ropes. But um, what happened was there was an MC and basically this MC pulled out very last minute. So my manager, Mark, got a phone call off of Mad Martin, the Polish promoter, to say, Mark, the MC's pulled out. Is there any way that you would do it? And Mark was like, nah, no chance. I'm not doing the MC. I've never done it in my life. I would do it. But there was a lad over from Jersey, Alec Burnett. He's a bit of a... He's a, he's a bit Another of a Bryce over here. A bit, a bit past Bryce's time. There's actually... Remember when Scotland played England at... Wembley and they won and they all raided the pitch yep. there's a picture of Big Alex standing with his scarf he actually helped pull the crossbar down I've, I, could, I could send it to you but Big Alex a big legend like he calls himself the Channel Island heavyweight champion he had a couple of boxing matches and all that he's a big character big gentleman but he actually travelled over to Serbia to watch me so when this guy's on the phone and Mark is like Mark says you know what, I'm not going to do it, but I've got somebody who will. So he's asked Big Alec Burnett, and Alec Burnett's like, I'd love to be the MC. So Big Alex never done it in his life, mad boxing fan boxed, but he's then MCing at this fight in Serbia. He's never done it before, and he just made notes and just went with it. You know, for the first couple of fights, he was terrible, but as he went on, he got better, and then by the time I was fighting, he'd actually got it down to a wee tee, but... You know, where else in the world would that happen? I've went for David Diamante, one of the most, you know, uh, one of the biggest MCs in boxing at the moment, for Alec Burnett, the Channel and heavyweight champion, calling men at the ring out in Serbia. Do you know what I mean? It's just mad. You wouldn't get that in any other sport. It's mental. But uh, it was funny. It was funny listening back. My mum and dad, actually, they were watching the stream for it and they said, was the MC Scottish? And I was like, hey, that was Big Alec. No, lie, you're joking. I was like, no. <laughs> they're sitting there and they're all arguing. Like, no, I can't be Scottish. Why would there be a Scottish MC out in Serbia? No, no, that was Big Alec. So I... Big Alec, the legend. Like Forget aye, the no, he is, he is a, He's a boxing MC aye. now. <laughs> He's an MC. MC Burnett. But I... <laughs> so there's a wee interesting outtake for the, my, my fight in Serbia. I kind of... Sums it up to be honest with you, but Class, mate. Got they're, got they're, that was they're, the kind of, they're the kind of stories you'll look back at back end of your career and, and think, bloody hell, man, look where I came from, where I got to. So, Ashy, aye, big, big Nick, you know, his goal is to become British champion. You know, he's Scottish, it's not something that many of any you'll be the first, wouldn't you? To become there's never there's never been a Scottish heavyweight British champion. There's there been Scottish there's been Scottish British champions, but there's never been a heavyweight British champion. What do you reckon, Ashy? You think the big lad, big lad, you but from what you know of him, from the time you spent with him, you think he's um you think he's he, he could go could go that far? I think so. I mean, 
I've got every bit of confidence in Nick. I've seen how he goes about his work in terms of as a rugby player, but I've also been following him closely since he sort of went down the route of boxing. And I think people, what people forget as well is that it was 2017 where Nick stepped away from rugby. It wasn't like he left rugby and six months later he was in a professional fight. It was a lot of time spent training and sort of brushing up on the the sport and, and actually putting a lot of grafting in the background. So, yeah, I've got every bit of confidence in Nick, as you mentioned earlier on, Shaky. He's had some some really top kind of amateur fights that were not easy, and he had to to work hard, and, and he obviously had to show that he, he had some some promise to come through those fights, and he did. And obviously, two from from O at the moment, which is which is fantastic. I'm I'm uh, myself and Bryce and and uh, DTH who also played at the Warriors. Whenever Nick's got a fight coming up, we're always. Uh, we're always trying to stream it over here and, and watch it and, and keep up to, to date with everything that's going on in social media. So I've got every bit of confidence. I think he's a fantastic athlete. He's got an amazing attitude and work work ethic. And what what more can you ask? I think he's got every chance. Um, and I also think that, you know, as much as people think that, you know, rugby is a completely different sport to boxing, I think that, especially second rows, I, I don't think, if you were to look at all the sports in the world, where where would you potentially find a boxer, a boxer that can go far? I don't think you have to look any further than rugby for for the second best or, or the second. What's what's the best way of saying it? The the sport that you could potentially pick a champion from. I think you got to look at rugby because they used people used to getting hit about the head. They're powerful a- athletes. They're tall. They've got all the athletic con um, sort of contributes that you need to do well in boxing. So you know, I actually think that. You know, people might look at this as a, a gimmicky type thing. It's someone stepping in from another sport. I, I don't think that we can look at it like that. I think you need to look at it like Nick's step. He's been away out of rugby for four years now. He's done a lot of pre, a lot of prep and a lot of amateur fights that have led up to this point. He's two from all, and by God, he's a phenomenal athlete. And I think that stands in great, great stead for moving forward. You know, I'll be honest. When I first heard about it, and it was actually one of your old chums, Nick. Paul Duncanson, Bishop Briggs is hardest man. I gotta give my shout out. I gotta give Dunkey a shout out, man. He uh, he does and said to me, "Oh mate, you should get you should get my a mate of mine out. You should you just got into heavyweight boxing. He's about to make his debut. It was so you were just on the verge of fighting the matchroom, and then that's when I, that from there I've been following you and seeing what you're doing. Um, but I was I was thinking at first the same kind of thing. Maybe this is just like a gimmicky thing, a rugby guy making a transition over." When you got in the ring and the, the bell rang in the first round, I was very, very impressed. Obviously, you're massive, which is which is which is a good thing. It's going to help you in your heavyweight boxing. But your hand speed, your movement around the ring, I was expecting maybe you were going to be a wee bit on the slower side, not at all. You're letting your hands go with good speed. I think you're going to be a I think you're going to be a handful for most heavyweights. I'm looking around and I'm seeing the British kind of scene of who, who's there thereabouts. What's your timeline? What what do you what do you realistically think if, if you really if you really want to to win the British title? What's the kind of goal that you and your management promoter etc. have got in mind? Well, my goal this year is to get at least kind of four or five fights. Um, obviously, it's very difficult at the moment where Britain and you know trouble moving across borders and getting stuff put on. But anyway, my goal is to get as many fights this year, four or five, hopefully five if I can. The year after that, the same again, four or five. Once I'm up to 10, 12 and 0, you've got to be looking at positioning yourself in a position where you're going to be fighting final eliminators to move into that British title contention, potentially a Scottish title on the way. There's a lot of good, you know, good Scott, there's a couple of good Scottish heavyweights. Okay. You've got Jay McFarlane, you've got another lad, you know what, Kasim. Uh, you've got a lad, Kasim, oh, yeah, yeah, who fights with Kinnock. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe we could organise a Scottish, you know, title fight down the line, something like that. Move it on like that and see where it takes us. But, you know, like I say, get as many fights as possible. Step it up a wee bit every time, learn a bit. And, you know, the sparring's going to be the most important thing. Travel around, try and get the best sparring possible. And who knows, two years' time, you could be 9, 10 and 0 and looking to position yourself into that, you know, title contention. So, aye, who knows? Like, like I say, every fight that I go in, 
is another fight further than a lot of people think I would have ever achieved. So for me, I just keep training, keep working hard, keep my head down, keep applying myself and, you know, keep trying to improve. And who knows, like Ashley says, that there's not many guys six foot seven, 115 kilos. I've always backed my fitness. I've always been a fit guy, always been strong. I just, just boxing and learning my box, you know, my boxing skill set, you know, picking up on different things that I need to work on and improving on those things, which is going to help me. And like you say, a fit, strong, six foot seven hundred and fifteen kilo with a good boxing IQ, who can go out there and you know make people work for every round. It's not going to be fun for anybody that's in there with me. So don't, no, get, no. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm a, I'm a, I'm under no illusion of how difficult and how higher level the British title is, but there's no point in turning professional if you don't have something like that as your goal. So I uh, let's just see what it takes, and I'll put all the hard work in and do all the hard graft I can to get there. Well, I want to see Tyson one day. Fury. I'd love to see that. I <laughs> Tyson Fury. Um, I'd I'd love to see that. He, he's a, he's an yeah. idol of mine, Tyson Fury. He's, he's a legend. Well, Absolute legend. Well. Absolute legend. Do you know what? As well, like I think people don't actually understand how good a boxer that guy is. Unbelievable. Like, you look at him. Like I say, boxing's not all about big muscles and. You look up and you go, oh, what's he going to do? But the guy, uh, aye, he's a top, top fighter. And his knowledge of the sport is, you know, I think people don't give him the credit he deserves for that. So, aye. I mean, listen. Any, that, any chance of getting any sparring action when we're in? Listen, I would absolutely love to spar Tyson Fury. What you would learn from that would be unbelievable. The same as I'd love to spar any big name out there, you know, Joshua, um, in Britain, you know, they're the two main ones, but like I say, Tyson Fury or Josh, if you got the chance to spar, you'd bite the hand off Dylan White. If you got the chance to go in and spar a guy like that, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd jump at the opportunity. So hopefully those those are maybe some kind of things that will happen down the line, but for now, just keep training and keep working hard, and then when fights or those kind of opportunities come up, you're ready to take them. Listen, mate, I think um, exciting times ahead for both of you guys. Um You've got a big game this afternoon, mate. We need to be letting you letting you go very, very, very shortly. Playing against Houston today, what's a good good chance of a victory? Yeah, I think so. Uh, they're they're a team that are sitting a bit lower down in the table. Uh, we're on top at the moment. We got beat in the last game that we played against Atlanta, which was a bit of a shock, I think, for quite a lot of people. So we had a bye week last week, and we spent a lot of time just just working hard, just getting trying to get to the bottom of. Um, you know, the problems that we're kind of seeing out there and, and a lot of it just comes down to, to tweaking a couple of things. So I think we're going to see a lot of that hard work sort of transfer onto the field this afternoon. I think we've been a really good place all week of training. So looking forward to it. Another gorgeous day here in LA and a 4pm kickoff. So yeah, pumped to get out there. Best of luck, mate. Best of luck. And Nick, keep doing your, keep doing your thing. Keep the head down. Listen, I've got an idea just to finish with. When... Uh, when the big man makes his way back over from uh, from LA, I reckon it'd be a really, really good idea to set up a boxing charity boxing match between you two. I would pay oh, no. good money. I'd, <laughs> I'd pay good money. I'm sure many people would pay pay good money to see a three three minute rounder between you two, and just to see. <laughs> you, Nick, you, you, you up for it? Do you know I've, what? I've, I've, Do you know I've, what? I've, I've you know, I've called Nick out a couple of times on social media when he's had some stuff. <laughs> I've wrote beneath it, I'll still knock you out, and I'll take my word back on that. I'm not stepping out. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I've actually, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to punch Adam. He's too good, good looking a lad. Yeah, is that one of his good looks? Just, but who do I damage him? John Welsh, on the other hand, he fancies that he fancies himself big time. And another one who I'm calling out, Al Kellogg. If he wants it, you can have it as well on the same night. <laughs> you can do two of them on the same night. You know what? I reckon two of them on the same game. night. Two of them at the well, same time. No sweat. No problem. Right, I'll tell you what then. Rather than you getting in the ring, Ashy, you promote the fight. I'll help you promote the fight. We'll set two, two, in, the one, two in the one night. And we'll get these two chaps lined up. Whether or not they're going to turn up in the night is probably it's 
Nah, listen, listen, um, Welsh is a good lad. And you know what? Welsh would be a handful for three minutes. He can handle himself, Welsh. And uh, Big Al, Big Al, Big Al is a big legend, but he's he's also a second room from my original club, Alan Glens. And I'm fed up hearing, hearing people talking about him. So if he ever wants it, he can have it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Listen, lads, it's been a pleasure for you two, obviously, taking a walk down <clears throat> the lane. I can, I can see... I don't know these guys, by the way. I'm just laughing with you. But <laughs> I can see between you two that this is a, this. Is, so I'm sure whoever gets a watch of this will have a will have a laugh. Hopefully, the two chaps see it and they put out something in social media and they say they're up for it, and then we'll get a it. Fouse, it a it'll probably rip into me. So I, uh, big whale, she loves it. He loves it. I've called him out on a few different times, but I've never called Al out. So quite keen to see his reaction. Like it. <laughs> I like it. Listen, lads. You look after yourselves. Best of luck this afternoon, Ashy. Keep training, Good luck, Ashy. and uh, we'll we'll speak we'll speak soon. Thank, Thank you, boys. Thank you.